So, Philippa, welcome to Time Team Tea Time. Very, very nice to see you again. I have very nice memories of you appearing on Time Team and, and meeting up with us. Had you had any contact with archaeology before you came on a Time Team? Had it appeared in your earlier career? No, it's, uh, you know, I think there's a point where... Uh, I, I, where I very much went from being, when I first went to Sussex University, I was going to study English literature. And there was a point then when I was absolutely converted to history. And from then on, I was really locked onto documents and history and reading of the records and understanding the records. And I, although I saw the time team on television, of course, like a viewer, like anybody else, I, I had a, a, a genuine interest in, in a sense, the buried record as well as the written record, but uh, it never occurred to me to actually go anywhere and dig stuff up. And so Time Team was a, a revelation for me. And, you know, it stayed with me as a very powerful experience at the time, but also as a, a wonderful way of, of, in a sense, being in history in a way that you can't, you are imaginatively when you're looking at the written record, but to actually be at a building, especially if it's been hidden or buried, actually to step on the very ground or to find material things, that was fantastic, it really was. I, I remember reading somewhere that you made a reference to the carving in Ludlow Castle that was supposed to have been done by Arthur and he uh, had done a carving, and I remember you saying it was sort of layers of reality. The carving is legend, the sketch is history, and the thought they carved, it was carved by Arthur, was fiction. And it's a sort of multiple level of things, isn't it? That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And I think that's what I feel about it, that at the very at the very end of the chain of understanding and thinking about it, there is a thing. That's what's so wonderful, both about archaeology and about history, that there is something did happen and we can find ways into it and we can find ways of understanding it. And in the course of that, we may very well have to get our hands dirty and we may very well have to go to the place where we think it happened. But there is, at the very end of it, a reality, a, a, an experienced reality. And I always remember I, uh, we had a sort of little conversation in which I was uh, trying to suggest something I'd said to Roman historians, which was one artefact was worth several historical theories. <laughs> but that, I, I think I was being a bit sort of it, it's archaeologically arrogant, really. Um, you know, it it depends, doesn't it? It depends on the artefact and it depends on the theories that like they're not all equal. Like during my time with Time Team, you know, when I was present on a, a couple of digs, sometimes somebody would be very enthusiastic about a bit of a tile and I would go like, it's not doing it for me. I'm glad we found it. But if it doesn't signify something more than a bit of a tile, it's just a bit of a tile to me. Whereas, uh, you know, there are some historical theories which are genuinely illuminating, which open doors to other things. Um, something um, as simple as, for instance, the reason that there are not a lot of women in the historical record is not because they weren't doing anything. It is what was recorded. And just, if you take that as a theory, it just opens up everything, archaeology as well. So I think it depends really on the, th it depends on the theory and the, on the artifact, but I absolutely take your point that sometimes something from the made record or the built record just completely opens it all. First time I met up with you in 2004, we were at Sion Park, and Sion Park was the place where Henry's exploding, swelling coffin leak blood on the floor, licked up by dogs, which in a sense, was it the, the fair maid of Kent who predicted that, or was it just a biblical reference that he would it, end in that way? It, it's certainly biblical. I can't think of a prophecy of it other than 
uh, than the Old Testament. And at Sion, when you and I were together there, um, we actually were at the chapel where his body was left overnight, I think. What's your memories of Sion Park and, and being with Time Team? It was a big historical picture there, wasn't it? And the river and everything was beautiful place. It was huge. It was, I mean, firstly, it was an incredibly beautiful place, but also, and a very peaceful place, but it, it produced such a vivid picture of it, in a sense, the, the disgrace of Henry's End. And I remember, uh, I remember the artist's drawings of it, you know, the pictures of it, which were so powerful. And suddenly, really realising that uh, it was such a vivid disgusting picture to end this kind of this great kingship moment. Um, but the other thing about Zion was that I was so interested in the nunnery which had been there uh, attached to the abbey and that it was at Zion that we found some pieces of spectacles which had belonged to a nun at the time and I remember the archaeologist that I can't remember who it was it was a young woman she'd been digging and she she said to me look and I looked at them and I lifted them up and I looked through, the glass was gone, but the lenses were still there. They were like pince-nez, they would have been just popped on your nose. And I looked through them and I thought, I am looking through something that a uh, late medieval woman looked through. I am literally sort of seeing through her eyes. And it, it's one of those moments where history and the modern world just blend together and you realize also in a sense that time is as you know physicists tell us sort of meaningless that there's something which belongs to then and here's me that belongs to now and yet we're in the same we're we're looking through the same thing it's extraordinary it's extraordinary it, it was interesting for me because i we're we're at the moment talking to the original members of time team and friends and saying we're calling it the fantasy fantasy site. And really it's a kind of future specials. We did a lot of documentaries where we worked on the background of something and then did a three day dig. So we had more time. And I, and I was thinking, I wondered which site uh, that you would like, if you had your own archeological unit, which in a way you do, <laughs> if you, there's two sites that I related to when I was looking this up. One was the Battle of Tewkesbury, mm -hmm. which it seems is not that well known. People know about Towton, where they found burial pits and all sorts of things. But Tewkesbury was really a critical battle in the Wars of the Roses, probably the penultimate battle. And, and that site has had relatively little work done on it. Is that a location that would appeal to you? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it can't not. I mean, I think the Wars of the Roses battles, the battle sites have been a bit neglected because uh, in a sense, the Wars of the Roses tend to get a bit obscured by the English Civil War that comes after it. So they are neglected and also the the death rate is so appalling during the Wars of the Roses at Tewkesbury especially that you know you're bound to have a lot of historical remains there and also part of overcoming a, a civil war as the Wars of the Roses were is that uh, everybody gets back to normal as quickly as possible so you don't have a big memorialization of it so I think it they they would be very very interesting um, I think really you could go back to Groovy and you know find some wonderful stuff. And um, I'm sorry, I've been, sorry. Am Amptill is another place that that has come up, which which is linked with Catherine of Aragon, who I think is possibly one of your favourite characters. Again, relatively little known. She survived. She didn't. She wasn't actually killed by Henry VIII, which was a sort of miracle in a way. Oh, heartbreak. Yeah. Like I, I count, I, I blame him for it. I really do. Um, you know, I think uh, the courage that it took to confront him and constantly resist him, that's extraordinary. But if you were looking at somewhere, I mean, there's, a, there's quite a suggestion 
that uh, there, that there were bodies found at the Tower of London, which may or may not be the princes. Personally, I think they are not. But uh, there's a very clear suggestion of where they were found. It would be very interesting to do a dig at the Tower of London. Why not? If this is a fantasy dig, why don't we dig the Tower of London and see if we can find for sure uh, the room where the princes were kept, we're pretty sure we know where it was. But if that was so, where the stair was, where they were said to be buried. I think going back to Tewkesbury, <clears throat> one of the things very memorably in your book was that moment that Edward the Fourth, who, you know, is the, the king in splendor, he's married for love. And yet, my God, he's got that Yorkist desire to finish off his enemies when he's got them. And I think Somerset and the others are in Tewkesbury Abbey, which still exists. And he has a choice about them and a choice about Clarence. And in both cases, clemency doesn't come into it. No, I mean, I think the thing about Edward and, you know, his brother is that his brother betrays him multiple times and the 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 point at which they tip interestingly enough is uh, a point over witchcraft that his brother is said to have had a wizard and they're predicting the king's death and they're said to be trying to cause the king's death and i think there's a point at which i mean i think edward was extremely affectionate towards his younger brothers, and he had a very profound sense of family loyalty, um, which you see in the fact that he never turns on Richard, even when there's a real sense that Richard has lost loyalty towards that royal family and towards that line. You know, the divisions between them are very strong, but Edward never turns away from his younger brother. But I think Clarence, I mean, he's, 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 he just, never stops. You're never sure what Clarence is doing, but it's almost always some kind of complicated temptation to get to the throne. I mean, it's, it's second son syndrome, <laughs> only far worse than anything we've ever seen. And of, and of all those characters, I, I've got many, many questions because Elizabeth I seems to me that kind of strong woman who you followed in, I think, The Virgin Bride, was it? Virgin's Lover, yes. Virgin's um, Lover, yeah. And then very much so, a very jaundiced view of her, I have to say, in the book The Last Tudor, where yeah. actually the research shocked me, where I found that she, she either killed or imprisoned or led to the deaths of all her cousins. I mean, it's she also she is someone who is so frightened herself, is brought up so much uh, as a girl in a in a court of. I mean, I believe she's brought up by a psychopath. I think Henry VIII, in his latter years, is a serial killer, and we do ourselves a great disservice if we if we find his behaviour sort of funny. So he's taught in. English primary schools today, as Henry VIII, the man who had six wives, I believe he should be taught as Henry VIII, the man who serially killed all of his friends and all of his advisors and all of the women who stood up against him in any way or failed to deliver what he wanted. I mean, he's a monster. And that's Elizabeth's father. So I think what you have there is someone who is truly psychologically damaged from childhood and who then never feel safe, never feel safe enough to love anybody, never feel safe enough to marry anybody, never feel safe in her relations, in her family, because they are all potential heirs. And, you know, the Grey sisters, Jane Grey and her two sisters, um, were really no serious threat to Elizabeth during her lifetime, but they would have inherited after her. And when they had boys who would therefore be an obviously attractive heir it was like the end of their lives and i think if anybody wants to a sort of balancing view of the jolly henry the eighth with his wives your um taming of the queen which which covers the life of catherine parr is an incredibly um memorable very emotive 
uh, story of a woman crushed by a psychopath or attempted to be crushed by him. It's, it, it, there's so much about Catherine Parr that I absolutely love. Firstly, in traditional history, she's set up to be his last wife and the nurse and you know, provider, carer for his old age. And it, she isn't like that. She was never like that. We do have some uh, sort of pharmaceutical records from her, but they're all perfume and bath oils and lovely glamorous things. She's not nursing him in any serious way. What she does par excellence is she manages him. So she it's, they actually have the guards at the door of the garden to arrest her for heresy and therefore treason, and that carries a death sentence, and she turns it around. I mean, she is just magnificently brave. And it's not that she isn't guilty. Uh, she is undoubtedly leading the Reform Party at court, as Cranmer is leading the Reform Party in the country. She wrote books. She, she published books. She yes. was a very literate queen, and she survived the old sod, really. <laughs> Uh, her story is actually probably the only story of uh, a happy wife of Henry VIII that she endures marriage with him. It's not a very long marriage because he is at the end of his life, though nobody knows it at the time. He's uh, energetic enough and he's virile enough to hope to conceive a child on her. And he's virile enough that when he writes his will, he provides for the heirs of wives after her. So even while they're married, he is looking ahead to what might come next. And she's number six. Uh, he actually courts a lady in waiting at her court. He's looking out for number seven while he's married to her. Uh, she's young enough to be his daughter. Uh, she survives him by incredible skill and management and by courage. So when they come to arrest her for heresy and treason, which carries a death sentence with it, she literally, she faces them down and they don't take her away. And for the rest of her life, she has the courage to go on uh, thinking about the reform of religion. She is much more Protestant uh, than Henry and she writes and so she's the first woman to publish in the English language. Uh, and she's the first woman to publish under her own name. She doesn't publish anonymously. After his death, she's free to publish. And very, very romantically, after his death, she marries the man that she loved all along, uh, Thomas Seymour. And he takes her to Sudley Castle. And there's the connection with Sudley Castle again, where she's buried. She died in childbirth, uh, which was obviously the fate of so many women in the pre-modern period. And uh, she died having only been married to the man that she loved for a year. It's, oh. it's, it's very tragic in that sense, but all history is when do you stop the clock. So in my novel about her, I stop the clock when, she, when Henry dies and she escapes this dangerous marriage uh, with a murderer. Uh, and who's able to marry the man she loves. And I know that um, I've read a, a little bit around Tidelands, and there, you, you've now changed historical um, period, and I, I know you wrote very well, uh, there's, there's a very nice, very explanatory bit at the end of one of your books in which you talk about the transition from the great and the good, as Mick used to call them, to ordinary people, which is quite a thing. I, I, I'd be a bit bereft, lost, if I abandoned all those amazing characters. But you've made that decision to find ordinary, often a strong women in difficult situations. She, I think your character gets accused of being a witch and is dunked on a water wheel, which is an incredibly memorable scene. What, what drove that transition? I think, in a sense, I was, I was always in my own mind writing about interesting women. Uh, it happened that the ones that were recorded were related to 
great and good that in a sense there are very very there are very little records of the lives of ordinary women in the Tudor period if you want to get any records of a life from birth till death you're going to be working in the upper classes and your job's going to be a lot easier if you're looking at royalty. For instance, someone like Anne Boleyn, as enormous as she looms in British history, we don't actually have an accurate date of birth for her. Nobody recorded her birth. They didn't know she was going to be Anne Boleyn crying out loud. We want to know. They didn't know it was that important at the time. Uh, so we literally don't know her date of birth. We don't know much about her childhood. We know she went to France and that she was in service uh, for the royalty here. But it's only when she enters the court that she enters the written record when you start finding her in uh, the wardrobe records, where you start actually getting something that you can get a grip on. Like we know what that she was at a particular party because we know what dress was issued to her. It's stuff like that that really makes a novel come alive. And so if you want to write uh, a historical novel on the record about Tudor women, you're really pretty well confined to the, uh, you know, the very, very higher levels of the upper classes. But that's, it's not that I wanted to write about kings and queens and prince and princesses. It was that I knew what they were doing. So when I came to fictionalize the record, I had a record to fictionalize. Then I came to a point where I went like, I, uh, you know, I'm really done with, with palaces. You know, they're great, they're wonderful. I've loved being there, but I actually want to be a little bit more with the vast majority of people, ordinary people. So I'm doing two things at the moment. I'm writing a non-fiction. I'm writing a history of English women, uh, which isn't very much about the great people. It's supposed to be about normal women, by which I mean everybody who calls themselves a woman and normal lives in the sense of not, none of these lives are officially exceptional but all of them are completely extraordinary because they are lives that we don't know about. So they are women uh, housewives, but almost all of them are also spinners or entrepreneurs or uh, they're negotiating loans or they're highway women or they're fences, you know, or they're criminals or they're prostitutes or they're in service, which pretty well means you're in part-time prostitution. Every, all of these lives that we think of as being just a housewife, it's always, and they're doing something else as well because that's how you survive uh, before, uh, that before women can earn a wage which can keep them. So I'm very, so my attention always was on ordinary women doing exceptional things as part of a normal life. And, uh, I've just had the courage to step away from the historical records which are available and go like, I'm going to make a composite character from all the records that I have. So I know quite a lot about midwives in the 17th century because uh, the male physicians are trying to exclude women from practice. So you, you get a lot of reports about what women are doing wrong from their male competitors. So it doesn't matter that the source is in a sense quite corrupt, you're still getting a lot of reports of what they're doing. So I know a bit about that. I know about women in the um, English Civil War because people have written histories of English Civil War in which they cannot help but refer to women holding sieges and women's part in running the land and the estates when the men go away. So what I decided to do was instead of leaning on a record of a known woman whose life had been recorded, was look at all the other, in all the different places, records about women and put that together to say, here is my representative woman. It's, here is my metaphor for a woman of, and then, in a sense, imbue her with the love and the imaginative life, which I bring to all of my historical characters, because even someone like Elizabeth I, my Elizabeth I is not like anybody else's Elizabeth I. All historians look at the record and then, in a sense, construct 
a, a character and it's always fiction. And one of the great secrets of history, uh, which has been a secret for far too long, is that all historians work in fiction also because they all get an idea of a person and we all get a different idea. You can see it's fiction because we all end up with a different idea. My Thomas Cromwell is not Hilary Mantel's Thomas Cromwell and much the better are both of our Thomas Cromwells for that. My Anne Boleyn people didn't even see. My, my Mary Boleyn people didn't even know existed. The record was there, but nobody had imbued her with the sort of liveliness that you can do when you look at a character and say, well, what was she really like? And that's exactly what a novelist has to do in order to write a novel worth reading. And it's what a historian has to do as well.